Hey, Z-Man, it's your buddy Slim. Slim Garrity, from the Galactic Happy Hour. We met at that Alice Cooper themed rave, and then again at Cheetar's makeup seminar. Right, right, yet, wait, what do you mean Shipwreck warned you about me? Why are you at Shipwreck even talking? No, it's not true, I didn't do that. Uh-uh, I don't even own that much body oil, and, huh, must have gotten disconnected. Well, howdy party people and space cadets, and welcome to the Galactic Happy Hour. I'm your host, Spider Island Slim, and on this week's episode, we will be talking about my top favorite Cobra action figures from the G.I. Joe toy line. And this will just be old school, well, old school-ish, first run of G.I. Joe action figures. And as I've mentioned many, many, many times before, because as I said, I'm super redundant. I'm even super redundant in saying I'm super redundant. But yeah, super redundant. So one of the joys and the best things about figures, in my opinion, especially back in the day, was figures that would, could be used as other things. So the best toys, the best figures, were the ones I could really use my imagination on and use as other things. Whereas, yes, I was a big G.I. Joe fan, quite a fan, enjoyed it very much. I was an even bigger fan of the toy line because so many of the figures lent themselves to so many other things. And on this list, you'll see that several of the characters on here aren't even favorite characters. Heck, a lot of my favorite characters aren't on the list. So let's, let's begin. And number five on the list is the Alley Viper from 1989, who specialized in urban assault and warfare. And this orange and blue, very bright, day glowy kind of guy, came with a shield, a backpack with a removable grappling hook, and a machine gun. But it was that shield that really made him stand out, and the little visor thing too. Man, I loved this figure, and I never once, I mean not even once, played with him as the Alley Viper. I just always would make up my own characters for him. Superhero, maybe super villain, and I just really liked his visory thing. How I guess it wasn't supposed to fully cover the face, yet it did in the toy form. And that just gave him kind of just an odd, almost alien, no, well not alien, almost robotic, sci-fi kind of look. And that's one of the, to me, the strongest points of G.I. Joe. Where it was kind of grounded, or it seemed so on the surface, but then there were a lot of really cool sci-fi elements and just things you wouldn't expect from a military-based cartoon. And I know a lot of people, they rag on the Day Glow era of G.I. Joe, but see, I think it's super cool. And just imagine, you're a soldier, a member of G.I. Joe, and you're out in the battlefield, out in the field, ready for attack. And suddenly, you have a, a squadron, a battalion, of whatever you call it, of all these Day Glow nightmares flying at you all at once. You wouldn't know what to do. Talk about throwing somebody off. I tell you, a big neon soldier, that's a lot more intimidating than like a camo or someone in black or something. Yeah, so I stand by the Dayglow nightmares. I mean, I stand by the Dayglow era of G.I. Joe. Now, the Alley Vipers, their first appearance was in the Deke cartoon, which I won't discuss that because I guess that's kind of a, what do you call it? A point of contention for many G.I. Joe fans. Whereas I don't think I've seen many of the Deke cartoons, at least not enough to have an opinion on it. But either way, apparently that's it's kind of a touchy subject. But they appeared in the episode of Operation Dragonfire Part 2. And I guess that was somewhat after the movie, because I guess it, you know, I guess I should have done some research, but nope, nope, nope. I mean, I did do some research on figure, but not on the subject matter at hand. Next. And number four on the list is another one that I never played with as what they were supposed to be, but talk about an amazing figure, and that is the Hydro Viper from 1988. And the Hydro Vipers were kind of underwater, sort of, I guess, Cobra agents. Again, another Cobra member. You'll, 
will definitely notice a running theme on this episode, probably. But the Hydro Vipers, known as the Demons, or the Demon of the Deep, specialized in undersea terrorism. And they came with an amazing-looking helmet, a scuba pack, harpoon gun, a knife, monstery flippers, breathing hoses, and a black manta ray. I mean, talk about just a ton of features and playthings and just great. I initially saw this figure and I was taken to it immediately. And I remember at first, I actually did play with him as kind of a, uh, I guess a watery kind of thing. Because as I've said before, your buddy Slim, he likes water type creatures, monsters, things of that nature. And I actually have memories of playing with the Hydro Viper in the pool. But see, we lived on this very hilly yard. I mean, ridiculously hilly. So we couldn't have a normal pool. But we had a big back porch coming off the house. And so we got one of those, if you remember from back in the day, heck, they might still make them. The kind of vinyl pools that came, they were rolled up and you'd unravel them and fill them up with water. And I mean, I guess they were probably big enough for two or three small type kids, two, maybe one normal sized kid to play in. Definitely couldn't swim, but you could still play with your toys and wade around in it, have a good time. But I remember playing with him in there. But then the main thing I used him as, and this was in the day before alien and predator kind of toys were very common. He was my predator, yeah. I mean, because I loved me some Predator, and it was very cool to have this figure. I mean, I guess looking at him, not really very Predator-like at all, but to my kid mind, he was just the perfect Predator-type figure. And again, like I was talking about with the sci-fi kind of elements to G.I. Joe, it was just super cool having these almost monster elements to it as well. The Hydro Viper only appeared in animated form in toy commercials. I guess they never appeared in the actual animated series. Now, in the comics, and back to the sci-fi thing, they were surgically altered to be the perfect underwater monstery things. And if you look, you take off the helmet, wow. Even as a kid, that face creeped me out. As an adult, it really creeps me out, because... Well, we're not going to say why, because, yeah, very, uh, yeah, creepy. And number three on the list is a figure that is not only the one of the few on here that I played with as the character himself, it's one I played with exclusively as said character, and are one I loved in real life, and that's Serpentor from 1986. And wow, you want to talk about someone that really just took to the Serpentor character? Well, I give you a hint. Green, probably drunk right now, and really popular with the ladies. No, it's not Moss Man. It's your buddy Slim. And doing research for this episode and past episodes of recent really got me thinking. And I noticed kind of a trend, not only with 80s cartoons, but with me myself, was the kind of the big bads of shows, Skeletor, for example, I guess they would get so popular that the shows would kind of start softening the characters a bit. And then they would bring in a bigger big bad. And I always seem to be taken with that bigger big bad. From Skeletor to Hordak, from Cobra Commander to Serpentor, and from Megatron to Galvatron. Not that Megatron ever got soft, but Galvatron was kind of the bigger big bad, even though he was the same guy, at least in the cartoon. So I don't make my own point. What? Huh? Anyways, so Serpentor. And Serpentor was a great figure. He came with a hooded backpack. -y. Well, not really a backpack, but his Serpentor cow hood thing that plugged into his back. He had a cloth cape, a dagger, a golden cobra, and the chariot. And I just really liked him a lot. I liked his kind of sci-fi backstory, how he was created, and how he's this almost Frankenstein-esque thing that Dr. Mindbender uh, put together because he was sick of old Cobra Commander's nonsense and shenanigans. Yeah, really good stuff. And his first appearance was in the comic, issue 49, and in the cartoon, Arise, Serpentor, Arise, Part 4. Interesting that he didn't pop up until the fourth episode. 
and he was created using the DNA of many great warriors and Sergeant Slaughter. Speaking of Sergeant Slaughter, I unfortunately basically missed out on wrestling as a kid. So when I did finally start watching it in the 90s, here was Sergeant Slaughter, and he was a bad guy. So that really, I was like, wait, huh? Sergeant Slaughter's not a good guy? What? I guess just being around Cobra too long just kind of, that's the way she goes, Rick. That's the way she goes. An interesting thing about Serpentor also, he just really kind of breaks a lot of the molds. I didn't have a lot of vehicles growing up. And I actually think in G.I. Joe, I only had three vehicles total. And one of which was Serpentor's chariot that he flew around on. So if that, I mean, that definitely counts as a vehicle, but a vehicle that came with a figure. But G.I. Joe, I think some of them often did come with figures. Because I know I had the chariot. I had a big uh, purple Bodhi thing from Cobra. Got one Christmas. And then I had the, oh, what's his name? Just heard, was just talking about him the other day. The deep, is it Deep Six? The uh, underwater guy whose legs didn't move, just his arms. I had him in his little vehicle thing. Yeah, Serpentor. I understand that people seem to not dig that character too much these days, but back then, I just thought he was super cool. Yeah, I distinctly remember playing as Serpentor on the playground and doing that this I command probably way, way, way too much and not even probably commanding anything, probably just running around saying this I command and not commanding anything. Well, that's all for Serpentor, and I think with that, we should take... A commercial break. In the two-dimensional world of video dots and dashes, flat blips and formless blobs, one video arcade game soars a dimension above the rest. Saxon! Experience the control as you climb and dive. Feel the power as you attack and evade. Discover a new level of excitement with the true feel of action in three dimensions. Saxon, from the master design engineers of Sega. each of us. There is both good guy and bad guy. In the G.I. Joe video game, you can be G.I. Joe fighting for right and justice. For the Super Villain Cobra, battling other players with laser blasts and venom bombs. We can defend, attack, save, destroy, play the courageous hero or the unspeakable villain. The choice is yours. <laughs> G.I. Joe, new from Parker Brothers. And we're back, and it's time for the horoscope of the week. And this week's horoscope goes to cancer. Cancer. You will apply for, but be rejected in a very humiliating fashion to the Cobra organization. Unfortunately, they felt that, or will feel, that your laugh is too annoying. Number two on the list, and this is another of the rare examples of a character I played with as the character and exclusively as the character, and this was probably the character I was the most on the playground until Serpentor came along, and that is Zartan from 1984, the master of disguise. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start this entry with a rant. Zartan's hair or the hood, whatever you want to call it. I am still, to this day, not convinced that wasn't supposed to be hair. I think they retroactively made it into a hood as a conspiracy against long-haired, kind of Alice Cooper-y looking people. Because just the way it would fall and the way it hung in the cartoon, it looked like hair. And there was an episode I was just watching recently where he was going to put on one of his masks and he kind of pulled it back like a ponytail. And then when he would take the mask off, it would come cascading down all luxuriously. I think it was supposed to be hair. Like I said, conspiracy. And wow, talk about just a great character. I loved his kind of rock and roll style. Like even at that point, I already was drawn to rock culture and punk culture. And Zartan just had that kind of awesome Alice Cooper kind of thing going. I shoot a lot of the Dreadnoughts did, but I just thought he was the coolest character. And I loved being him and playing with that figure. And oh, I just contradicted myself. I did have the Zartan figure, and he came with his ski sledder thing. So I guess I then had four G.I. Joe vehicles as a kid. But moving right along and trying not to contradict myself again, he came with a backpack, a bearded mask, a black pistol, panel things that went on his body, a, his swamp skier, 
And again, one of the only, that Swamp Skier was one of the few vehicles I owned. And the gimmick of the figure was that he was photosensitive. Yeah, he would turn blue when under direct light. And I just, I thought that was super spiffy and neato too. And if I remember right, you could even take his chest plate off so that you could see his chest all nice and blue. Because that's what he did. And then the cartoon is always, no, the light, the light. Because that's exactly what Zartan sound was like. As I was mentioning, before Serpentor came along, this was a character I always was. It's funny, just how I was as a little young and little monster kid. All my buddies, they wanted to be Snake Eyes. But me, it was always about Zartan. And funny thing, playing Zartan on the playground is broad daylight. And I'm sure I ran around, don't remember for a fact, but I'm sure I ran around going, no, the light, the light. Yet, Zartan couldn't be running around in the sunlight like that. Heh, <laughs> kids. Little goblin kids. But anyways, his first appearance in the comic book was issue 24. And his first appearance in the cartoon was the episode In the Cobra's Pit. Which, I think that's the first episode, isn't it? Somebody let me know. I didn't do enough research. And apparently, in the comic, maybe the cartoon too, but he could perfectly imitate anyone's likeness and voice using a mix of holograms, illusion, and hypnosis. I guess that would have been the, co- the comic, because I don't remember any, any of that in the cartoon. Then again, it's been a very long time since I've seen the cartoon. I just started watching it again recently. That's all for Zartan. And number one on the list, and this is another one that I never played with as the character, even though I don't know if you could technically count this as a character, but it's one I really, really loved, and that's the Bat from 1986. And the Bat, the Battle Android Trooper, it was a favorite then, it's a favorite now. Still, not only is it my favorite Cobra figure, it's just my favorite G.I. Joe figure of all time. And again, it comes back to the sci-fi elements of G.I. Joe, which is really what made the show for me. And his lower arm, the gimmick of the toy, his lower arm could be taken off and replaced. He had a gun hand, a claw hand, and a flamethrower hand, and a backpack that, if I'm not mistaken, it held all the hands when not in use. Talk about super cool. And at the time, when you had robots and android-type characters, they were often kind of boxy or really old-school kind of Uh, robots but these the bats were very sleek and just a great design I mean all being a robot aside it's just a great character design love that black silver and yellow colors on him even if he had just been a dude in a costume I would have loved that figure as well but being a robot that made me like him even more yet I really have no memories of how I played with them but I know I did and I know I didn't use them as bat troopers But anyways, their first appearance was in the comic, issue number 44, and in the cartoon, the episode Arise, Serpentor, Arise. Wow, we just keep coming back to that Arise, Serpentor, Arise, don't we? It was Dr. Mindbender's first appearance, the Bat's first appearance, and then part four, as I said earlier, was Serpentor's first appearance. So just great stuff was happening in that Arise, Serpentor, Arise. The Bats were the creation of Scrap Iron and... Good old Dr. Mindbender again. They started out as really tough characters, but then as the show went on, they ended up just kind of cannon fodder, like your foot soldiers from Ninja Turtles, so to speak. But it's the coolness of their design and the greatness of that figure and how much I had fun playing with the figure that really makes them stand out as my number one on the list. And that's all the time we have for this week. Please like, comment, subscribe, and may your pants always be filled with marshmallows. Uh, Yo Cobra!